Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Hey, listen, let's get into the Word of God. Are you guys ready to get into the Word of the Lord this morning? I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to pray. I want to ask if you're able to stand before the Lord in reverence. Why don't you guys join me in, in honoring the Lord as you stand? Father God, we come before you in this place, Lord, and we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. Father, we don't come into this place to hear from a man, to hear from a woman, or to hear from a band, or anything of that nature, but God, we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church, Father, and we ask that you would open our eyes and, uh, to see and our ears to hear the word that you would cause us to hear today, Father. I think that you would minister to the depths of our soul your word today, God. We thank you for that. Lord, we also want to ask that you would set your hand upon each and every uh, uh, church in, in, in the body of Christ that is ministering and celebrating in the name of Jesus Christ, your word and your will, Father. We don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but Father, as co-laborers in, in the family, in the body of Christ, Father. So we ask that you set your hand upon our Lutheran brothers and sisters, our Episcopalian brothers brothers and sisters, our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Methodists and our Baptist friends, Father. We thank you that you set your hand on the Calvary chapels, Father, on the rock churches of, of Temecula, of, of Coachella, of Riverside, Father, and the churches all across the world in the United States that are gathered together on this day to teach and to celebrate in your word, Father. We ask that your presence would be amongst them as well as with us, Father. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for all that you are accomplishing in your word and in your body. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. If you've got your Bibles, why don't you open them up and turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Here we pick up in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. We're resuming our study in Hebrews, line upon line, precept upon precept, slowly but surely. How many of you were here last week with Pastor Jim's message about rest? Well, listen, if you were here or if you weren't here, I'm going to say before we even get into the message today that you need to hear that. You cannot afford to go anymore in your life without grabbing a hold of that message. I tell you what, go outside, get the CD. If you don't, if you don't have anything to get the CD, go online. It's free. Listen to it on your phone, on your computer, whatever it may be. Go to the library, put a pair of headphones on, and listen to that message. You cannot afford to miss out on that message for you. I tell you what, it is something that will impact your life, that will bless you greatly. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to, to, to patronize you. You need to hear that. And as we pick up in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, we're going to remain in verse number one, picking right up on the tail end of, of Pastor Jim's message last week as, as far as the rest, the, the godly rest, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Rest is not just sitting on the couch on your day off or, or relaxing or taking a, a nap and, and rejuvenating your physical spirit, but rather the rest of God, the peace of God that comes upon you. doesn't matter where you are. doesn't matter if you're in the midst of trial or the midst of chaos. You have rest and peace in your life and in your heart. That's why I say you need to grab a hold of it to understand those concepts. But today we pick up in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, first verse, continuing on. In Hebrews 4, 1, we read, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So first we see that there is a promise for you and I. I want to encourage you before we go anywhere today that we see that the promise remains, meaning that this promise was pre-existing in Hebrews the third chapter, Hebrews the fourth chapter. The writer is speaking about the children of Israel, specifically in the time of their wandering in the wilderness and the, and the, the promise that God had for them of entering into their promised land. And now the writer says to you and I as we read this, therefore since a promise remains. So we need to understand first and foremost that God has got a promise for each and every one of us for our promised land. Pastor Dan brought a great point that the promised land is not our, our promise to enter into the kingdom of God through heaven because the, the promised land was faced with oppositions, with trials, with giants for them to overcome. We in heaven are not faced with those. So our promised land, the promise that God has given to each and every one of us is on this place right now. So God has a promise and he says, therefore, since the promise remains. So you need to understand that the promise that God gave to the children of Israel as they were walking into that promised land is also the promise that comes to you and I to this very day. It is in existence today. 
Sometimes they might say, oh, well, the promises of God are for the Old Testament. The church is new. But here we see clearly that the promise remains. I want to, I want to stress that to you. But now the interesting part of this verse is he says, since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Here the writer says, listen, there is a promise for each and every one of us, but you and I have got to conduct ourselves in fear, in reverence, and respect, lest we come short of it. Implying that we, the church, we, the people of God, even though God has a promise for each and every one of us, if we don't live up to what God has called us to do, we run the risk of falling short of the promise that God has given for us. Very, very serious place that we have got to understand. And today, the title of the message is The Fear of the Lord. And today, what I want to talk to you about is the fear of the Lord. You know, the church in the 21st century. Now, when I say the church, I don't mean just the rock church. I mean the body of Christ worldwide, the body of Christ all over America, so forth and so on, has focused greatly upon the grace of God. Now, a lot of times I was just reading a blog from a young man who was saying that they didn't understand how the God of the Old Testament, who was a fierce God, who had his favorites and who wiped out others, who, who, who gave the, the, uh, the seed of, of women to, to, the, to, their, to their children and then took from others. They said they don't understand how that's the same God that all of a sudden what happened when one day all of a sudden Jesus Christ came and now he's a God of love who accepts everybody, who loves everybody, who, who welcomes everybody in. And they said that cannot clearly be the same God. But I want to tell you something. That is the same God. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. That there is not two gods, that he did not suddenly change his mind. He did not suddenly change his thoughts or his processes towards us. But what has happened in the modern day is that we have so focused on the grace of God. We have so focused on the forgiveness of God. The God of a second chance. The God of a third chance. The God of a fourth chance. The God of a 155th chance. That we have missed out on the other side of the road. And that is to have a fear for the God that is above us. The God, the creator of all things. And for us as Christians, listen to me now, this is a huge statement. It is 10.30 in the morning and I'm going to drop a, a theological bomb on your laps. For us to, as true Christians to fully understand what it means to be saved, what it means to have a relationship with God, what it means to live and be adopted into the family of God, means that we have got to have a healthy fear, a healthy respect, a healthy reverence for our God. Because if we live solely in grace, Grace and grace alone, and we do not have a respect for God, what we're truly doing is playing games with God. This is deep. You know, in Matthew, the 10th chapter, and the 28th verse, Jesus Christ, this is the New Testament. This is Jesus Christ preaching to those. He's sending his disciples out amongst everybody, and he says to them, he says, do not be afraid of those who can destroy the body but not the soul. He says, but rather fear him who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. Jesus Christ said, listen, it is for you to understand that men may give, may, may, we may have fear of men. We may be afraid of the things that men can do to us. But he says, what men can do to us as people is nothing compared to what the God, the creator of the universe, the one who holds all things in his hand can do to mankind should they choose to reject him. So we have got to have a healthy understanding of the fear of God. Well, what does that word fear mean? You know, in the New Testament, the Greek word, and the Old Testament, the Hebrew word, carry many meanings. It's like the word love. I can say that I love pizza and I love my wife, but clearly I don't love pizza the same way that I love my wife. But when we are to fear the Lord, fear counts for what we do to God. So when it says that we should fear the Lord, it says that the fear of the Lord is a trembling. Moses, when he was in the presence of God, said he trembled at his voice. The fear, the word fear says to be afraid, to put to flight, to a sense where you can't barely stand in your own shoes. You want to go the other way, to be terrified of something. To hold in respect, that word fear means to reverence, to honor, to place something above everything else. 
We can do that with men. When the president walks by, we reverence him. Whether our opinions of him are high or low, it doesn't matter who he is. Because of the position that he's been placed in, there is a reverence and a respect for that authority. You know that there are secret service agents following him, watching his every move and watching your move as well. So there is a level of fear with that. If you've seen in the military system, when an officer walks by an enlisted man, that enlisted man springs to attention and salutes that officer because the fear of that position has been placed into him through his training and through his tradition. And he knows that if he doesn't honor that position, if he doesn't honor that title, that consequences could face him. Yet so often in our life we focus solely upon the grace of God, that God is a good God, God is a great God. Jesus Christ said that God loved us. He brought the God of love, but he didn't leave it just at that. And he said, not only did I come to bring love, but I came to bring the sword. Why? To remember that our God is a fierce God. The word says that our God is a jealous God for our attention. And when we forget to give God the fear, the honor, the reverence due to him because of who he is, but we treat him as when we go to him when we need him, but when we don't we forget about him then all of a sudden we face certain consequences in our life like Hebrews 4 1 says that we may miss out on the promises that are, are, are meant for you and I you know I teach in the in the Bible college here at the church and and the class that I teach is church history and we were just talking about a period in time in church history in the 1700s called the Great Awakening it was a great revival in, in the United States, in the 13 colonies. We weren't yet the United States, but we were the colonies of England. It was a great revival in England. And there were, there were several people that were at the head of that. But in America, there was a man by the name of John Edwards. And in, in, in England, there was a man by the name of John Wesley. And in both countries who would travel, there was a man by the name of George Whitefield. And you know what, the, during this time of the Great Awakening, this was a time before they had loudspeakers and microphones and television and the internet. This was a time when people would go on foot or on horseback from town to town, of small area to small area, and they would teach to, to 50, 100, 200, 300 people. And in a period of two years, within the 13 colonies just alone, some 50,000 people turned their hearts to God. It's called the Great Awakening, and England was greatly impacted the church had become complacent. The church had become ceremonial. You could sit in church and that's all they wanted was for you to come and fill a seat. And these men began to preach. These men began to teach. And all of a sudden the Spirit of God, revival poured out in America and on England and spread through Europe. And you know what the interesting thing about all of these three, John Edwards, John Wesley, and George Whitefield was? Is that all three of them spoke before they taught about the grace of God. They spoke about the fear of God. And they would tell the, the, the congregants, they would tell those about the preaching, about the fires of hell that would swallow us up should we choose to reject God. They would instill the fire of God. Jonathan Edwards spoke as a, a message called sinners in the hands of an angry God. And he equated those who turned their back on God as somebody who held a spider over a candle. Unremorseful of burning that spider. That's what God treats to those who turn their back on him. And they instilled the fear of God to one who once said that the people were holding on to the pillars of the church because they could feel themselves falling into hell. And then when they grabbed a hold of the fear of God, then they would turn around and preach the grace of God. And it would open the eyes of the church. It would open the people that God is not something that we go to when we want to. God is not just after you and I sitting in a service at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning and the rest of our lives, the rest of the week going and doing how we want. God is after a healthy fear. He is after a healthy respect. He says that if you fear me, if you respect me, if you honor me, your life will reflect that. So today as we speak about the fear of the Lord, I'm not going to teach you to preach to you about how to fear the Lord. Just as a son to a father would learn at that time to fear his father. Why? Because of the experiences that he came. When I was a child, my dad did not have to sit down with me and say, son, this is how you fear me. But through the experiences that I had, through you getting into the word of God, you reading what God says about those who turn their backs on him, that those who use his grace in vain, that those who operate without the fear of God, when you get into your word and do what God has told you to do, you will see what the fear of God is like a father when he disciplines his child. And you'll learn it. So I'm not here to teach you about how to fear God. But what I do want to do is I want to show you what the fear of God in your life does to you and I as Christians, as those who walk in the spirit of God. 
We as a church, we focus so much on grace that we lose the respect of God. Could you imagine what we would be like if each and every one of us came into this place with the fear of God all across the nation, all across the world? You know, revival cannot break out in the land until the people have a fear for God. And so we come into church and we say, I don't like the way that guy preaches. He's too young. He's too old. I don't like what the music they say. That's not my music. That's somebody else. That's some other ethnicity music. And they come into church and because they lack the fear of God, they think that church is entertainment for them rather than them to worship their God above. And we have got to have a healthy understanding of who God is. So today we're going to talk about the fear of the Lord. I've got four simple things for you to grab a hold of. And when you think about the fear of the Lord, to understand that this is what the fear of the Lord does in your life. Are you guys with me this morning? Hello. We're talking about the fear of the Lord. Number one this morning, the fear of the Lord draws our attention to him. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of First Peter. The fear of the Lord draws our attention to him. Let me give you a practical example of this thought. One of the things that I enjoy doing as far as a hobby of mine is to do woodworking. I just enjoy it. As a child, I was always all about Legos and building and putting things together. Now as an adult, it's not about Legos. It's about building furniture, things big, things small, whatever it may be. I enjoy it. So in my garage, I have a wood shop. I've got all the different power tools and all the different old hand tools of things of that nature. And there are things in my wood shop that I understand can inflict great physical harm onto my life. There's one especially that I have a healthy reverence and fear for, and that is a thing called a table saw. A table saw is a saw that is made out of cast iron where a blade comes straight out, and you put wood through it, and it cuts it precisely and straight. There are some 40,000 amputations a year for table saws alone because people don't have a healthy respect for what that blade does. And I remember I was with a friend of mine, and he asked me, are you afraid of this stuff? And I said, you know, I'm not afraid of these tools, but I do fear them and I do respect what they can do. Because I know that this piece of, uh, of machinery can cut through a two-inch thick piece of oak without even thinking about it. So I know what it can do to my hand, what it can do to my fingers is unlike anything else. There have been times when I have lost my respect for this piece of machinery and pieces of wood have been caught in the blade and shot back to me once it hit me in the chest. And I have that piece of wood on display in my wood shop with the markings of it running through the blade to remind me that if I lose my respect, if I lose my attention for that piece of machinery, it could invoke serious harm into my life. Because whatever our attention, whatever our fear is on, whatever our honor and our respect is on, our eyes are drawn to that. And I was working with a friend of mine, and he was cutting a piece of wood, and he, had, he hadn't used this piece of wood very, or this piece of machinery, but maybe a few times in his life. And so he didn't quite understand or didn't quite grab a hold of the, the consequences that might face him should he not pay attention to the blade, not the wood. The wood cost two, three, four dollars. The blade, his fingers, his hand, whatever might happen, could, could change the course of his life. And so you don't pay attention to the wood, you pay attention to where your hand and that blade are at all times. Because ultimately it doesn't matter what happens to the wood. And as he was pushing this piece of wood through, his finger was coming close to the blade. And his finger was in the path of the blade. And had he not, had I not slapped his arm or had I not, you know, nudged him and say, hey, 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 watch where your hand's at. He may have put himself in a position with that blade because of not understanding the respect to have for that piece of a machinery. And that may have cost him something that he didn't want to pay for. We have got to have a healthy respect, a fear, a reverence for God. And when we draw our fear, when we honor, when we, like the Bible says, when we tremble at the word of God, let me tell you something, our attention, our focus, our eyes are set upon God. We are focused on that. I don't care about things on that table saw. I care about that blade. And we care about God because that is what our fear, that is what our reverence is set upon. Now I had you turn to the book of First Peter. In First Peter here, he's writing. And Peter is writing to the church, and he gives us a great illustration of focusing our eyes on God through fear. And I'm going to read you verse number 13, verse number 17, 18, and 19 will be on the overhead. Peter says, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, gird up the loins. Hey, listen, batten down the hatches and be sober in your thinking. 
Don't think for a moment that you can loosely uh, uh, think about this. Don't think for a moment that you can casually grab a hold of what has been given to you through the blood of Jesus Christ and our salvation. But he says, be sober about it. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And here we go in verse number 17. And if you call on the Father, if your eyes are set upon the Father, if your attention is drawn to God, he says, who judges who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout your stay here. He equates you and I as travelers in a foreign land. While we are here in this life, we have got to conduct ourselves throughout this time of our stay in fear. With our eyes calling upon the Father, with our eyes drawn to God, we have got to focus our attention on God. And when we have a healthy fear, when we have a healthy respect for who God is, our eyes, our attention is brought to Him. He goes on to say, Knowing that you were not redeemed, knowing because of what you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like gold, silver, from aimless conduct you received, uh, by tradition from your fathers, verse number 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, because you and I know now all of a sudden the reason that we lack fear from God cannot be, oh, I didn't know, because we know that there was a price paid for us. It was not gold, it was not silver, it was not all the riches that this world can contain, but rather it was God's most precious possession, his son, his only begotten son that was beaten bloody and died on a cross for you and I. So therefore now, through our conduct, through our minds, we must focus our attention through godly fear, through godly reverence on him. Because of now what we know. And in sitting in this place today, you cannot leave this place without the knowledge that you've been bought with a price. Therefore, because of that price, you have got to conduct yourselves, the body of Christ, the Christians, with the godly fear, the, with a respect, with a, healthy, with a healthy terror for the God of our love. Yes, he's the God of grace. But he's also a God that wants your attention. He's also a God that gave everything that belonged to him for you. Therefore, he wants everything that belongs to you and your attention to be set upon him. The fear of God puts our attention upon him. I'll put this up on the overhead in Psalms 147. Verse number 11, the Bible tells us the Lord takes place or takes pleasure in those who fear him, who hope in his mercy. Our eyes are set upon God who hope in his mercy. You know when you hope for something, you put your attention on that? Now let me tell you a little bit the difference between hope and wishful thinking. You can say, I, ho I, I hope I go to Hawaii someday. That's wishful thinking. You'd like to go there. But maybe you have it in your mind that on some certain anniversary or some certain special occasion that you're going to take your family and it doesn't matter how you're going to do it, you're going to go to Hawaii. When you have a genuine hope, there's a chance that it may happen. What do you do? You focus your concentration. You focus your thoughts on that. You open up the travel brochures and the catalogs. You know the good hotels. You know all the things to do when you're there because there's a glimmer of hope. There's an attention that is brought to it. When you just wishfully think, you say, oh, that'd be cool, man. That'd be great if I get to go. But when you think you're going to go, you have hope for it. And your attention is drawn to it. And the Bible tells us that God takes pleasure in those who fear him and hope in his mercy who pay attention to his mercy. So we have a healthy respect, a healthy fear, a healthy reverence for our God, but then at the same time we hope, we think about his mercy. Our eyes, our attention is brought to him. So we talk about the fear of the Lord. Number one is the fear of the Lord brings our attention, draws our attention to him. Number two today, the fear of the Lord puts us in our place. Hello. If you've ever seen a child in that, in that learning stages of their life, perhaps when they're learning to tie their shoes, perhaps when you're teaching them to do something. Children get to a specific age. If you've, had, uh, if you've had children yourself or you've had brothers or sisters or nieces or nephews, you've probably come into counter with this when they come into that all-important age of their life when they know everything. And they're trying maybe to learn to tie their shoes and you've taught them that the, that the loop goes this way and the rabbit comes out through the hole and goes around. And oh, I know... And it takes them 30 minutes to tie their shoes when it should take them 25 seconds. Because we, it's ingrained in us as people to bring up, to rise up in our own self-consciousness, to rise up in our own self-assurance that we know. 
And when we have the fear of God in our lives, when we tremble at his word, when we respect God, when we give him the fear that is due to him, we realize all of a sudden that our place is not I know, but rather our place is you know. The fear of the Lord puts us in our place. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms. We're going to kind of hang out in Psalms, Proverbs, and the Old Testament for a little while. Turn with me to the book of Psalms in the ninth chapter. Here the psalmist is writing. And in the ninth chapter, he's writing about the afflictions that are all around him, those that are persecuting him, those that are coming against him. And in the ninth chapter, in the 20th verse... I'm going to read you verse 19 and then we'll read 20. He says, Arise, O Lord, do not let men prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Verse number 20. Put fear in them, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. We as mankind, we as humans think that sometimes because of the knowledge that we have, because we can explain how science works, because we've discovered gravity, because we've discovered the universe, because we've put a man on the moon, that we in our own selves have become gods to ourselves, that we have risen up beyond the knowledge, we have evolved amongst all other life forms on this earth to be the supreme beings, but rather here the psalmist says, you know what, God put the fear in them so that they would realize that their place, that they are just men and that you are God in control. And while we can teach animals to jump out of water and do flips, and we can explain scientific wonders, it is God who holds the universe, all things, in his hand. And in the fear of God, the healthy respect, the reverence, the trembling at the word of God puts us in our place to realize that we are not the ones in control, but rather it is God who is in control. If you've got your Bible, turn with me a few pages over to Proverbs in the 15th chapter. I told you we're going to kind of be bouncing around in Psalms and Proverbs a f- couple pages over. Proverbs in the 15th chapter, in the 33rd verse, the end of this chapter. He goes on to say, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. Why? For first and foremost, because when you put the fear of the Lord, you understand that you have been put in your place, that you are not in control. What you think you know, you realize that you don't know. Why? Because God knows. So it is the instruction of wisdom. Why? Because now all of a sudden you realize it's not about your mental capacity, but rather God's capacity and his all-knowing, the one who holds the universe. But then he goes on to say, before honor is humility. Why? Because fearing the Lord and humility Go hand in hand. When you fear the Lord, you are humble. Why? Because you realize it is not about you. You realize that it is not about your knowledge. You realize that it is not about what you can do, what you can accomplish, how strong you are, how witty you are, how good looking you are, but rather you realize it is about God. And before honor is humility. And we see in the Bible time and time again that they who bring themselves up will be brought down by God. And they who bring themselves down will be brought up by God. Let me give you the most blessed example of all. God himself, Jesus Christ, came to this earth, born in a manger. And before he went to the cross, naked, bloody mess, he washed the feet of his disciples. And yet he was glorified, ascended to heaven. Yet... We see another example of an angel named Lucifer who through the pride of his own mind said that he would be exalted like God and God cast him down from heaven into the deepest, darkest pits and we know him as Satan. So we can see that when we rest in our own self-assuredness, when we lift ourselves up, that we will be brought down. But when we live a human, a, a humble life, a, hum, a life of humility, then all of a sudden God says, because of that, because of your fear of God, I will bring you up and it puts you in your place. The children of Israel, as they're going through the wilderness, Moses comes into the presence of God on the mountain. And Moses himself, as he recounts his experience, he said that he trembled at the very voice of God. He he was on his face before God. And Moses humbled himself before God so that God would bring him into his presence and allow him into his presence. Moses was on the mountain in which God said that nobody could touch this mountain. Nobody could come near this mountain. No beast can come because if they touch this mountain, because his presence was on it, that they would be turned to stone. Yet Moses was in the presence of God. Why? Because he humbled himself. And therefore he knew God. 
But then the children of Israel down on the valley, down in the desert, they only knew God through the answers of their prayers, which was for, 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 for nutrition, for food. They only knew God because he appeared to them in a, in a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of uh, a cloud by the day to guide them into their, their promised land. They did not know God because they humbled themselves. They know God because he showed himself to them. So therefore, Moses, who humbled himself before God, dwelt in the presence of God, the children of Israel, who only knew God because they heard of him, because they saw his presence, because they did not fear him, did not know God, and missed out on their promise to enter into the promised land for that generation. And they were sent to wander into the wilderness. Because humility will bring us into the fear of God. But when we are prideful in our own thinking, when we think that God is just something that we put in the air, a name that we give things that we can't explain, then all of a sudden we rise up in our own self-assuredness and sure enough we'll be brought down into those places. A very common verse we know, Proverbs 16, 18 says that pride comes before the destruction, a haughty spirit, a prideful spirit before the fall. Amen. When we bring ourselves up, when we, when we rely on ourselves and we lose the fear of God, then all of a sudden we, we lose our place where God has for us. Are you with me this morning? Amen. We're talking about the fear of the Lord. Number three this morning, the fear of the Lord guides us in our lives. The fear of the Lord guides us in our lives. In Proverbs, the 14th chapter, if you've got your Bibles, just turn a couple pages over there. One page in my Bible, Proverbs, the 14th chapter, and the 16th verse, we see that a wise man fears and departs from evil. But a fool rages and is self-confident. A, a wise man fears and departs from evil. You know that word depart is a word that signifies movement. When you go into an airport, generally the first thing you look at is one of two TV screens. One that's labeled arrivals, one that's labeled departures. And here the word of God says that he who fears God, he who understands their position with God, he who reverences word, uh, God, he who trembles at his word, who respects the very things that he says, he says he departs from evil. He jumps on that plane headed the opposite direction. Why? Because the fear of God guides us in our ways and it keeps us from sin. Like a child, after being disciplined by their parent, they know that if they do it again, their discipline will be a little bit more severe than the time before. Therefore, the thought of the consequences that may happen will keep them from going into that same pattern. That's the nature of parenting. That's the nature of growing up. And when we fear God, we know that the consequences of our sin, the consequences of our unbelief, like Hebrews tells us, of the possibility that we may miss out on the promises of God, keep us and direct us, and they keep us from sin. You want to get out of those things that keep coming back and that sin cycle that keeps returning in your life? I'll tell you what, stop focusing solely on the grace of God because, yes, he has forgiven you, but also grab a hold of the fear of God. And when you have a healthy fear for who God is, let me tell you something, that will keep you from doing the things that you once did. But if you can't get out of it, let me tell you something. I'll tell you right here. The evidence of your lifestyle means that you lack the fear of God. We have been so taught not just here. I'm not, we're not saying that I'm saying through generations we have been so focused and so taught on the grace of God that we have missed the fear of God and we have lost the respect. We have lost the terror that, that God holds. And we see God as this big cushiony teddy bear in the sky, but rather the creator of the universe who holds all things that is not affected by you and I, but has done everything for you and I to be saved, to be healed, to be restored, to be forgiven. But we have got to re revere him and fear him and respect his word. Are you with me this morning? Proverbs in 3, 5, and 6, a couple pages over. Very, very known verse. Verse 7 will be on the overhead. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Why? Because the guidance that you have, the GPS system that you hold, does not mean anything, but rather the understanding of God, the fear of God, to know that he is the one that holds the map, the guidance that you should have. Lean on his understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, respect him, honor him, give him the reverence and the respect that is due to him because of who he is. And all of a sudden, verse number seven, comes along and says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. You guys with me this morning in Isaiah, the 66th chapter. I'm having you turn to a lot of verses. 
but this is good. You gotta, you gotta get this. You have got, got, got to get this. Isaiah in the 66th chapter, turn with me there. And we see here that the prophet is writing, God, as he, as he brings his offense to those, or he brings his accusations against those in Israel. And he's talking to those that are doing what he has commanded. They are executing the sacrifice like the law commands. But he says to them, we're going to read verse 4 and 5, or 3 and 4, I'm sorry. And then we're going to come back and read verse 1 and 2 and see what God says. And so and all of a sudden, verse 3, talking about those who, have, who are executing the, the sacrifice just as the law has commanded them to. They're doing everything they're supposed to. He says, he who kills a bull as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain as if he offers swine's blood, something completely unclean. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol, just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so I, speaking God, will choose their delusions and bring their fears on them. Why? Verse 4, because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. They chose that which I do not delight. When we see the reaction of those, even though they were doing what the law told them to do, they were doing what in, their, in the outward appearance of what seemed to be right. God said, in their heart, when I spoke, they didn't hear. When I called them, they didn't respond. And they chose out of their own hearts to do what I displeased in. And you know what that says? They did not fear me. And he says, I will bring their fears upon them. I will cast them out. I will reject them. They turn their back on me. I'll turn my back on them. But read what verse number 1 and 2 says. Thus says the Lord, verse number one, heaven is my throne, the earth my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? Hey, listen, you ain't going to build God no home. He owns it all. Where is this place of my rest? Talking about rest in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, promises of God. For all those things, my hand is made. All those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one I will look. On him who is poor and of contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. God says, listen, you, don't, you can't do anything that I already have. Everything you made, I, everything you build, everything you think came from my hand. But on the person that I will look, on the person that I will fix my gaze upon, on the person that I will fix my blessings and my sight upon is he who is humble in themselves. Why? Because they fear and they respect and they give God the presence and the praise that he is due, as well as who tremble at his word, who respect and listen to what God has to say about them. You know, God told Samuel in the, in, 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 that he desires obedience over sacrifice. It's not about what you and I do. It's not about sitting in service at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. It's about what we do with our lives when we walk out of this building, which shows the fear of God in our lives. And we as the church, we as people have got to shed ourselves of the appearance that because we sit in service means that we're going to get to heaven because we do everything that God said we should do, that we do. Does mean that we're going to get there because when we fear the Lord, that's when in our lives we truly get into a relationship with God. Amen. That's a hard word. That rubs a lot of hairs the wrong way. I know it does. But we have got to have a healthy respect for the fear of the Lord. Are you with me this morning? Amen. Last one for this morning. The fear of the Lord, number four, aligns us with his promises. You know, the fear of the Lord guides us in our ways, gives us the map or the trail in which we should go, but the fear of the Lord aligns us Sets our eye on the bullseye, our eye on the target so that we hit our mark. Even though we may be guided by the fear of the Lord, you know that through our lives, through our decisions, through our actions, through our thoughts, we may fall off of alignment on that path. We may still be on it, but not quite where we're supposed to be. Let me give you an illustration of that. For every mile that you travel, if you are just one degree off course, you are off for every mile by 95 feet. By one degree, okay, 95 feet, not a big deal. Just a smidgen, one three hundred and sixtieth off of course. But let's take an example of the Apollo missions when they sent them into the moon. Some 255,000 mile journey. If they were off by just one degree, they would miss the moon by 4,500 miles the distance from Los Angeles to Shanghai, China. They would see the moon as they passed by it. <laughs> by just one degree. 
But when we stay and we dwell and we live and we give God the respect that he's due, when we tremble at his word and we stay and remain in the fear of God, it aligns us with his promises. And we, like an arrow aimed at the bullseye, hit our mark instead of missing it from the left or to the right or to the top to the bottom. And we fulfill the promises that God said that they still remain for you and I. We fulfill those promises and we meet those expectations and we celebrate and, and rest in the peace of God. Are you with me this morning? Praise God. Let me show you something. Psalms, the 31st chapter, I'm just going to put it up on the overhead. While I do, turn with your Bibles to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Psalms, the 31st chapter, verse 19. How great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you. How great is your goodness, which you have laid up, which you have stored, which you have held on to, for not those that come to church and sit in service that come to church and call themselves Christians and rely on the grace of God to allow them to stay in the position and the state that they currently are in, but rather that those who fear God and want to do something about their lives so that the next day they are not the same as they were the day before, but rather they are moving forward, aiming at that mark, at their promises. He says, how great is your goodness that you have laid up for those who fear you. Amen. Now check this out in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the last, last verse we have for this morning. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Here, the author of Hebrews is writing, he's speaking about uh, the, the, the voice of God, and he uses the example of, of God and the presence that he came on the Mount of Zion. And he said that because his presence was there, nobody could enter on this mountain. If they came to the foot of the mountain, if they touched the mountain, any beast, any man, they'd be turned to stone or they'd be killed by an arrow. And then they said, then he says that the voice of God spoke and the earth shook. And Moses recounts his, his, uh, his experience and he says that he trembled at his work. And then the author of Hebrews in the 12th chapter goes on to say, and there will be a time again when God's voice speaks and the earth will shake and this time heaven will shake. And he says everything that shakes, God will remove. Jesus Christ himself even said that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will remain the same. And he says that God has the ability who created all to remove all from him. But then... He speaks to you and I who live and dwell in the fear of God and the relationship of God. And he says to them in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 28th verse, Therefore, because of all of that, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, goes well beyond our dwelling in heaven with God, but rather to dwell in relationship, to dwell in the presence of God for eternity because heaven and earth may pass away, but with us in the fear and our relationship with God cannot be passed away, cannot be taken from us because God has ordained us, God has brought us, God has called us, he has given us the promises of that. The kingdom that we have cannot be shaken. He goes on to say, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. Church, it's not just about the forgiveness of God. We cannot discount, and I am not by any means lowering the grace of God in our lives because that is important. That is what gets us. It is by grace that through faith that we have been saved, but at the same time, we cannot lose sight. We cannot lose vision of the respect that God desires, that God demands from us, his church, to come into a place, to come into our relationship with God and not treat this as something that we set our Bible down, the very word of God that we should tremble at. We set it down on the coffee table and we pick it up again a week later. 90 minutes before church, but rather to respect and to fear God because that is what God desires. The word tells us that the spirit that dwells within us yearns jealousy, jealously for our attention. God gave us his everything and he wants your fear. He wants your desires. As a matter of fact, verse 28 is not the last verse of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse number 29 is, and it tells us what God is that we should remember. Verse 29 says that our God is a consuming fire. Yes, yes. So we not ought to just think about God as this big teddy bear, this big slot machine in the sky that when our times are tough, we go to him. But when our times are good, we forget all about him. But rather to understand that our God is a consuming fire. And our attention in our life should be drawn to him. Our attention in our eyes should be set upon him and thought upon him. Because we know that, number one, the fear of the Lord brings our attention, draws our attention to God. Number two, the fear of the Lord puts us in our place. Number three, the fear of the Lord directs us, guides our ways, directs our path. Number four, the fear of the Lord aligns us with his promise. 
Could you guys get something out of that word this morning? And lastly, I want to ask that if you could bring somebody with you on Wednesday night. We want to pack this house out. God, uh, Pastor Jim's going to bring an amazing message. And you, we want you guys to be a part of it as we minister to the pastors as well as to those in this service. So I want you to maybe say, I don't normally come on Wednesday. Make it a point to come on Wednesday night, this Wednesday night. You don't want to miss out and be a part of what God has. And bring your friends, bring those who are not saved, those co-workers or whatever. Because Pastor Jim's going to see something. You're going to see something out of the word of God. And Pastor Jim's going to teach the pastors on how to give an altar call. And he's going to show them how to do it too. So bring somebody out on Wednesday night. I encourage you guys to be a part of that. Listen, there's one more thing I want to do before we finish the service. It'd be a shame for us to have just praise and worship and have a, an anointed time of worshiping God and to hearing about the fear of the Lord and to leave this place without me asking you whether or not you were going to be connected with God should you decease or should you die to check yourself and where you are with God today. So I want to ask you this. If you were to die today and you were to leave this place and die, heaven forbid that'd be the case. I pray that it's not. But if you, that, that was the case, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? Only you and, no, and God can know the answer between that. But I want you to examine yourself. The Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I'm not sure that heaven or hell exists. I don't even know where I stand on the matter. Let me tell you something. Just because you don't believe that hell is real doesn't mean it's not. That's like me saying in my life that, you know what, I don't believe in semi-trucks and truly believing it maybe because I grew up in the country where I've never seen one, yet I can go and stand in the slow lane of the freeway and lo and behold, I'll meet one face to face. It's time for us to quit playing games with God in our heads and to understand that hell is, heaven and hell are the very real places. As a matter of fact, God thought it real enough to tell us about it in his word. Jesus Christ thought it real enough to preach about it in his gospels. Therefore, it's real enough for you and I to take it serious and to quit playing games with God. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I'm a good person. I don't cheat on my taxes. I've never robbed a 7-Eleven. I do good things. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Surely good people go to heaven. That's, where he that's what heaven's all for, is for good people. Let me tell you something. Just because you say that you're a good person doesn't mean that you're going to find your way into heaven. Just because of your good deeds, because you live your life better on one half than you do on the other doesn't mean that you're going to find your way into heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I can ever do on our own will ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Well, but Pastor Luke, you know, my parents raised me in church. I went to Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes. We went to church on Christmas and on Easter. I'm here today. You know, I was baptized. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says it because you were brought up in church as a child because your parents gave you a title called Christian that you're going to find your way into heaven? Because you sit in a service on Christmas and on Easter to this day you're here because somebody blew smoke and water over you as a baby because you attended Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes means that you're going to find your way into heaven. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that? Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that. Listen, guys, I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you the truth and to not play games with you today. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I know about God. I know the memory verses. I know about Moses and Abraham and, and Jonah and Joseph and Jesus. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God because you study the Word of God, because you know the Word of God, because you've even memorized memory verses that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you know who Moses, who Jonah, who Jesus, who Abraham is, that you're going to find your way in heaven? Can you show me where it says that? No, where in the Word. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, yet they're not going to find their way into heaven. The Bible also tells us that the devil himself quoted scripture to Jesus while he was in the wilderness. So therefore, we know that the devil knows the scripture. So does that mean that you're going to get into heaven because you've memorized some verses in your life? Nowhere will you find it. It's time for us to be real. It's time for us to be honest and to evaluate where we are and where we stand with God in this place this morning. Well, Pastor Luke, you know, as a leader, I sit in church, I'm faithful in my attendance. You know, I do good things, I volunteer, I help. Does that mean that, doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? I do good things. I say, I, in my last church, I sang in the choir. I even carried the pastor's Bible. Led a small group or discipleship group. Can you show me the word of God where it says because you carried the pastor's Bible, because you have a card in your wallet that says you're a member, member to a church, because, because you do good things, because you volunteer? or you volunteered at another church, that you're going to find your way in heaven? Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere in the Word. As a matter of fact, in the, in the book of John, in the third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? 
The Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. Because it says that, we know that Nicodemus has dedicated the first part of his young life to memorizing and studying the Scripture. Nicodemus was welcome into the temple, to his church, to teach the Word of God. He gave to the poor. He said all the right things. He wore all the right clothes. And you would think that Jesus Christ, based on what Nicodemus had done, would pat him on the back and say, Nicodemus, great is your reward. You just keep on going. But he says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Well, what does born again mean? You hear that word, you think of radical, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. Listen, God is not after your mental ascent towards him of your carnal knowledge of him. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ speaking to the church, people like you and I, says, listen, I know your deeds, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Vulgar statement. A statement said to get our attention. It says, listen, I know your heart. I know you on the inside. And when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. When it comes time for you to meet him face to face, he better find that you are hot or cold because if you are lukewarm, he will reject you out. He will spit you out, cast you out of the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me tell you what lukewarm means. Lukewarm means that you're up, you're down, you're in, you're out with your relationship with God. Occasional church attendance, token prayer here and again. You call to God when you need him, you forget him when you don't. You lack the fear of God in your life. That's what Jesus Christ says. You're lukewarm. He says, if I come back and it comes time for you to meet me face to face, if that's you, you are, you are deceived in thinking that you're going to get into the kingdom of God. Guys, listen, I love you enough. I respect you enough to shake the foundation on which you stand, to check your heart in this place today. Say, Pastor Luke, I appreciate what you're doing. You find God your way, I'll find God my way. We'll all get there the same. You know what? Let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Let's do it Jesus Christ's way. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Let's do it Jesus Christ's way. He said in his word, he said that if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. So in a moment, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to go bang. I'm going to smack my hand on the Bible just like that. In a moment when I do that, if that's you, if you've never given all your heart to Jesus Christ, if you're not sure, I want you to pop your hand up. If you've been living your life lukewarm, lacking the fear and the respect for God that he requires of you, and this has been a game to you where you call upon God when you need him and you forget him when you don't, pop your hand up. You say, Pastor Luke, if I pop my hand up, somebody's going to see me. I'm going to be embarrassed. You know what? I'm not going to embarrass you if you put your hand up. But even if you did put your hand up and you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to be embarrassed for a moment than spend an eternity in hell because you couldn't stand for God? All across this auditorium, all at the same time, we'll do it in just a moment. Hands are getting ready to go. If that's you, if you've never given all of your heart, all of your life to Jesus Christ, If you're not sure, don't leave this place this morning without making sure. That's a gamble on your life that you cannot afford to make. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, lacking the fear and the respect that God requires and demands of you, his people. When I, when I smack my hand on this Bible, I want you to pop your hand up all across the auditorium. Hands are getting ready to go up all at the same time. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. One, two, three, four, five, six. Anybody else? Seven, eight, nine, ten. Where are you at? Keep your hand up so I can see it. 11, 12, 13, 14. If I see your hand, you can pop it back down. 15, 16. Where are you at? Let me see your hand if I can see it. If you're putting your hand up, let me see it. Give me a little wave. I see people pointing over here. I'll, I'll move to these guys. Hold on. Let me get you. Where are you at? Give me a little wave so I can see you. 17. You scratch your head, I'm going to count you. 18, I got you. Where are you, 19? Where are you, 20? I got them in the family room. I got you guys. You can put your hand in. Where are you, number 19? Where are you, number 20? You're saying, I wonder if I should. You should. Don't risk walking out of this place today. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He won't make his way into his life. He won't force his way into your life. He's already done everything he can by sending Jesus Christ a beaten, bloody mess for you. 
on that cross so that you can accept him. And if that's you, number 18 or number 19, number 20, where are you at? Pop your hand up so we can move on with this today. I know that you're in this place. God's speaking to you. Where are you at? Let me see your hands. Anybody else in this place today? Well, praise God for 18 or 19 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. When I do, if you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, well, stand in a moment, hold on. I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Parents, if your kids raise their hand, don't reject them the opportunity to come and give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. You're never too young. I want you to be bold. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ by your heart and your life. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You acknowledge that you need him by raising your hand. You get saved by asking him to come into your heart and your life. And I want you to be bold. You said you wanted to give Jesus Christ your heart and your life. Let us help you today. So at this point, I want to ask everybody to stand. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to be bold and come. Get out of your chair and meet me right up here at the altar. That's you. You can come. Come on. You can come. Come on. Come on down, come on down. If that's you, be bold. Come on out. Come on down. Come on down, come on down. How me know you? If that's you, come on, they're coming. Let's make them welcome. From all over the place. You come on, get out of your chair, get out of your seat. Come on down. Come on, we'll wait for you. You come. Well, praise God. Hey guys, this is what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of you to mine, to me. This is, this is Pastor Dave. Did you know that Pastor Dave was my junior high teacher 15 years ago? This guy is like the coolest guy in my opinion. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Pastor Dave's going to do something. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to pray a prayer with you. Don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to come into your life. He's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free things. A book that our senior pastor, Pastor Jim, wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. Super easy reading that allows you to see now what it is that you're entitled to as a Christian. As well as he's going to introduce to you a friend, a spiritual personal trainer. Like when you go to the gym and you see a personal trainer, somebody that will help you build those muscles nice and strong, make sure you're eating your spinach during the week. A spiritual personal trainer, a friend, somebody that will meet with you before service to, to teach you for 15 minutes some things of the nature of God, some things about God to build you strong in your ways of the Lord so you don't go back to the junk that you came from. So if you guys would turn to your left, my right, and go right over there with Pastor David.